have that knowledge. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, he will only say, ah, ah, ah. He will want to say it, but it will not come out. So this questioning will be a means of, of further degradation, of lowering that individual, making him feel even more helpless and, and uh, in a state of, of abject despair. So don't think that simply because you have your children memorize Islamu Dini, Wal Quranu Dusturi, Wa Muhammadun Nabi, you know, some phrase like this, which you just memorize that. Okay, kid, you memorize this. So when the questions come in the grave, you'll be able to answer. No, it's not about memorizing. It's not about memorizing. It's no harm to teach the children Allahu Rabbi wa Islamu Dini wa Muhammadun Nabi. It's nice. But they need to know what it means. They need to apply it in their lives. Just merely memorizing these phrases will not do anything for them in the next life. This is very important. Furthermore, that individual, after he has answered the questions, the good soul, the believing soul, then a window for, of paradise will be opened and the winds from paradise will come over that individual until the resurrection. For the evil, a window on hell is open and the scorching winds from hell will be roasting him until or her until the time of the resurrection. And it's important to understand this issue of the time of the resurrection in that some people will question, what about people who died 10,000 years ago? Are they waiting around in the grave all this time? You know, same thing. If I die now, you know, what if, uh, you know, Yawm al Qiyamah, the resurrection, is not another 10,000 years from now? It means I'll be sitting around in the grave all this time? No. No, this is not how we should perceive of it. When a person dies, it is as if the whole process of resurrection is begin begun. From the time you go in, you and, and, and go into that state, you go, your soul travels through this journey and it's settled in that situation, then the resurrection is going to come for you shortly after that. It's not a, a long extended period of time that, that you, we would perceive in this life with regards to those who died many thousands of years ago. Because when a person dies, he leaves, he or she leaves the time zone. They're no longer governed by time. Time, this is living on this earth, in this world, where the earth spins, you know, there's a day and a night, 24 hours, etc. That's for those living on this earth. When you go to sleep, sometimes you wake up thinking, you know, in your sleep, you're, you did a journey around the whole world. You visited how many countries, etc., etc. And you wake up and you see, oh, you only slept for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Another time... It seems that you just woke up, you've closed your eyes, and all of a sudden you're waking back up again. You didn't hardly sleep. You're still very tired. And you look at the watch, wow, you slept for two hours. No. Because when you enter this state, when the soul is taken, you're out of the time zone. So we can forget that issue of time. Now the point which is most significant to us here is that those who have died... There are Muslims around the world who call on some of those who have died. Whether they be Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or the so-called saints. They call on them in times of need. They ask them to fulfill their desires, their wishes. The fact of the matter is that, as we said earlier, at dua hu al-ibadah, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, reported in Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, that Calling on anyone, supplicating to anyone is worship. Is rep this represents a form of worship. And this is calling on others besides Allah. This is shirk. This is not acceptable. One can only call on Allah. Allah tells us in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 194, <laughs> Those who you call on besides Allah, call on in prayer, besides Allah, are slaves, 
like yourselves. They can do nothing. Just read in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 186, Allah says, ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. And if my slaves ask you about me, I am close. Ujibu da'wata da'an. I answer the supplications of one who supplicates if he does so, calls on me. This is Allah's promise. So we have to be very clear. If we are to face Allah in a position, a good position on Yawmul Qiyamah, if we are to come out of this life and enter a state of the grave which is pleasing, which represents glad tidings for us and our future, then we have to come out of this world with our hearts purified from calling on others besides Allah. Then we have a period till the resurrection. That period, Prophet Muhammad informed us has minor signs and major signs leading up to it. Among them, those mentioned in Sahih Muslim, that you would see barefoot, naked, poor shepherds competing with each others in the building of tall buildings. Bedouins on the desert building tall buildings. Also found in Bukhari and Muslim, that among the signs, knowledge will decrease, ignorance will abound, adultery will become widespread, and wine will be drunk. Women will abound and men will become scarce to the extent that there will be a single provider for 50 women. Furthermore, in another narration found in An-Nasai, Prophet Muhammad as reported by Anna said that among the signs, the minor signs, are that people will compete with one another in the building and decorating of masjids. This is something that is happening today. In Morocco, King Hassan built a masjid with a light laser beam that is supposed to link up with Mecca. I mean, it's a huge edifice, which he borrowed money from France, Riba, to build this masjid. This huge edifice. He's building a pyramid, like the ancient Egyptians built pyramids, leaving it behind the signs of their presence. We find, unfortunately, Muslims in different parts of the world doing this. The building of masjids is something people compete with each other in. A masjid. What is the, what is the purpose of the masjid? Is it that we should make it glittering with huge minarets and big dome, etc., etc.? And we only have a few people lining up in it anyway. It only fills up on Eid or Janazah. Is the time when it fills up? Yeah. Is, this, this, is this what was intended? The masjid, the house of worship, is supposed to be simple. I'm not saying we cannot innovate, meaning that we have to go back and build one like the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, we get a few palm trees, cut them in half, you know, stick up and put some palm fronds on the top and let's go out and pray. No, of course, it's not practical. The weather, etc. You know, we are allowed to use brick, concrete, etc., and build something. But it doesn't have to be the way people are doing it now, squandering huge amounts of money in these buildings. Truly, even the issue of a dome and a minaret. The dome, people feel, if you don't put a dome on a masjid, it's not a masjid. Guess what? Prophet Muhammad's masjid didn't have a dome. So what? He didn't have a masjid. You know, the, the Kaaba, built by Prophet Abraham, rebuilt in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and confirmed. Is there a dome over the Kaaba? No dome. So, the dome was a, a technological advancement at the period of time which had a purpose. There were usually windows around the side which allowed air to come in and circulate to increase the circulation of air. It had a purpose. Now we have 
central air conditioning, etc., etc. We don't need a dome. If the dome, because in many of these masjids, the dome alone will cost tens of thousands of dollars. And this is the fact. Any architect will tell you. It will cost tens of thousands of dollars. It is haram to spend that money that way for something which is not needed. Especially when we see among the signs is that people will be competing in the building and decorating of mosques. And the minaret. What was the purpose of the minaret? Was there a minaret on the masjid of Prophet Muhammad No. No minaret. Is there a minaret on the Kaaba? No. No minaret. So if our basic examples of masjids don't have minarets, this tells us this is not necessary. Again, people will spend tens of thousands of dollars to put up minarets. And what, what was the purpose of the minaret? The minaret, actually originally it was called Al-Ma'dana. It's a place where they'd make the adhan from. It stood on the roof. As the buildings got bigger and taller and more, they built some structure on top of the roof of the masjid so that the person calling the adhan could go up there. So his adhan could be heard. And it got taller and taller. Eventually they put a light on it so that people, when the city is very big, they'll be able to spot at night where the masjid is. Now, in our times, we have uh, amplification systems. We don't need a minaret for the adhan to be heard. Actually, in many of these places, you can't even make the adhan aloud. Right? Many Western countries, you can't do it. You can make an adhan inside the masjid and that's it. So it's so it is definitely a waste of money. And Muslims have to realize that they will be held to account for this. Now amongst the major signs, Hudayfa related on one occasion, and this is recorded in Sahih Muslim, that he and some of the companions were sitting in the masjid discussing things, and the Prophet Muhammad came and asked them what they were discussing about. And they related that they were speaking about the hour. And the Prophet said, It will not come until you have seen ten signs. Now he's speaking of the major signs the smoke, the Antichrist, the beast, the rising of the sun from its place of setting. The descent of Jesus, the son of Mary, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, three earthquakes, an earthquake in the east, an earthquake in the west, and an earthquake in the Arabian Peninsula. And the last of those is a fire which will emerge from Yemen, driving people to their place of gathering. Those are the major signs. As I said, due to the time frame that we have to work within, I can't go in and go to elaborate on what these signs are. There are many books available. As I said, most important thing is for us to reflect on the principles that we need to gain from it. At any case, when the righteous souls are taken, because the final hour doesn't come and there are righteous people on the earth. The righteous people will be taken after the time of Prophet Isa, after the destruction of the Antichrist, Righteous people's souls are taken. And the only those remaining are the corrupt. Satan will come to them, invite them to worshipping idols. They will begin to worship idols again. And corruption will spread through the land. Allah's name will not anymore be mentioned. At this time, the trumpet will be blown. When the trumpet is first blown, the whole world is destroyed. And then... The world will be remade, rain will come, and human beings will start to grow up from the earth like vegetables. This is how Prophet Muhammad described it. On a clear plain, the earth no longer has the mountains and things as we saw them before, but we're up. people are being resurrected on a clear, flat plain. Then at the second blowing of the trumpet, the people who have been raised up, they will stand, staring. And from this point onwards, of course, they're described as being raised naked and uncircumcised. 
and everybody will be scared for himself and herself.